This week on Jerusalem Dateline, a look back at 9-11 and what impact it had on Israelis and the world. It brought the reality of Islamo-fascist terrorism home to the rest of the world. Plus, an in-depth look at Israel as the startup nation. Today, Israel leads the world in this kind of action in terms of creating the new technologies that are great for the world. And Israeli scientists advance a new way to fight disease. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. North Korea may be thousands of miles away from Israel, but North Korea's nuclear and missile program threatens not just the Far East, but also the Middle East. Here's CBN News, Dale Hurd. As tense as the situation with North Korea has already become, it could get worse. South Korea believes the North is planning another missile launch within a few days. The test launch of what some suspect will be an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of hitting the United States could come this Saturday. That's the anniversary of North Korea's founding, and leader Kim Jong-un may want to show off his ability to target the U.S. with nuclear weapons. The stakes could not be higher. The urgency is now. And at a special meeting of the U.N. Security Council Monday, the U.S. repeated its warning to North Korea. Nuclear powers understand their responsibilities. Kim Jong-un shows no such understanding. His abusive use of missiles and his nuclear threats show that he is begging for war. Japan, which had a North Korean missile fly through its airspace, told the Security Council something must be done. The Security Council must act to stop North Korea from continuing down this road. South Korean warships conducted live fire exercises at sea today in a show of strength after the North conducted its biggest nuclear test ever of a hydrogen bomb. On Monday, Seoul used F-15 fighter jets and land-based ballistic missiles to simulate an attack on North Korea's nuclear test site to strongly warn the North over the recent detonation. China has begun nuclear radiation emergency drills along its border with North Korea. President Trump asked in Washington if he would attack North Korea, said, we'll see. Russia, China and the European Union all claim there is no military solution to the crisis, but all have condemned North Korea. The path undertaken by North Korea is dangerous, irresponsible and illegal. No U.S. military action appears imminent, and U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley is calling for the strongest possible sanctions against North Korea at the U.N., while the Trump administration looks into penalties against nations that do business with the North. Dale heard CBN News. People in the U.S. and here in Israel will commemorate 9-11. It's been 16 years since that Islamic terror attack struck the heart of America and changed the world. Israelis knew just how it felt, and some understood it was a declaration of war. Here's a story we did several years ago, but we thought it still remarkably relevant. CBN News' Julie Stahl brought us that story. Israel was a year into its own war on terror in September of 2001. Palestinian terrorists were aiming guns at passing motorists, and suicide bombers were blowing themselves up in public places. And we were actually buying our plane tickets in Manhattan on the same exact day in, in August when the Sabaru pizza blew up here in Jerusalem. And my mother said, don't go back, don't go to Jerusalem, it's very dangerous. It was dangerous. More than 170 Israelis and others had been killed in Palestinian terror attacks in the year before September 11th. Fifteen of those were killed in an attack on a crowded Jerusalem eatery, including seven children and an American woman. Ten years ago, this was a Sabaro pizza place on this busy corner in downtown Jerusalem. But when a suicide bomber struck here, many wondered if it wasn't a dual strike, killing Israelis in an American food chain. A month later, it was clear America was also under attack. My reaction was immediately that this is the beginning of a war. It's clearly after the attack on the heart of the United States, uh, symbolic uh, uh, targets, it will be a war. CBN News asked Israelis about that day. Rachel Ginsburg went into labor on September 11th, and then she heard the news. It was absolutely surreal because me and my husband are born in New York, and we. We totally didn't believe it. We, it was like unbelievable. 
and all the labor stopped and my baby did not come out on September 11th. I was just in shock. I got into my van and I, I drove to my friend's house, uh, who live, they live on a, on a mountaintop overlooking Manhattan. And uh, I watched the tower burn and we were in just disbelief because the week before we were at their house enjoying the view and now it was this fiery mess. Then all of a sudden uh, the tower fell right before my eyes. And uh, at that moment I knew uh, the world had changed. I think it brought the reality of Islamo-fascist terrorism home to the rest of the world. We knew a lot about it. Eli Carmon is an Israeli counterterrorism expert. He says after 9-11, Al-Qaeda trained its sights on Israel. At the beginning, it didn't influence uh, really Israel, but uh, after the demise in Afghanistan uh, and the Hamas successes in the Intifada, suicide bombings, Al-Qaeda decided to put the Palestinian problem uh, at the head of their priorities and attack Israeli and Jewish targets. Overall, Carmon says, the West has had success in quelling major terror attacks. The question for the future, he says, is whether the uprisings in the Arab world this year will bring more Islamic violence into the region. To talk more about the impact of 9-11 and what may have changed or has not since then, I talk with CBN correspondent Julie Stahl and CBN News senior editor John Waggy in our studio. Julie and John, great to be with you to talk about these events, 9-11 looking back and also what's happening uh, today. Julie, you did that story and it's kind of an emotional one for many of us. My son used to go to Sabaros for lunch and uh, what a blessing that he wasn't there and tragedy for too many people. Uh, you mentioned in that story about Eli Carmon. What did he say and why does that matter today? Well, he said, you know, he knew a minute, the, the minute he saw 9-11 that it was a declaration of war. And indeed, we've seen that in the last 16 years. There's been, you know, different arenas, different places where things have popped out or wars, and, but it's definitely been a war against the West, you know, the terror attacks. For years, Israel had warned and warned and warned the, the West, America, about different things, even about the pilots and the cockpits and airplanes. Yeah. And, um, you know, people, I, I don't know how well they listened or didn't listen, but they didn't take heed. And what, what we've seen is what starts in Israel, what starts with the Jews, never finishes with them. It always spreads out. So it's, it's not just against Israel, and we've seen that happen over the last 16 years. Many people say Israel's sort of like the canary in the mind. I mean, what happens in Israel is sort of uh, something that's going to happen around the world. John, uh, George Bush, uh, President George Bush at that time, made a famous speech after 9-11. He said the axis of evil, North Korea, Iraq, and Iran. And why does that matter today? Well, he identified that, Chris, in a State of the Union address to Congress in 2002, right after 9-11, just a few months after. And in doing that, he, he really was prophetic in a way, yeah. and nobody pays much attention to that speech anymore. He nailed one of the three of the axis of evil. Iraq was taken care of in 2003, and all the aftermath, we know all the problems that existed with that, but Iraq is not one of those problems right now. Iran and North Korea are both on the verge of going nuclear, and nothing's been done. Mm -hmm. In the 15 years since 9-11, it's, it's just as if they, they weren't an axis of evil, yeah. you know? And Bush said something in that speech. I was listening to an excerpt recently. He said, in any of these cases, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea, the price of indifference would be catastrophic. And isn't that what we're seeing is, is indifference or at least trying to minimize the danger that Iran as a state-sponsored terrorist poses to the rest of the world, right. including the United States yeah. and Israel. And we see right now North Korea actually being uh, nuclear. Testing a hydrogen bomb. bomb. Yeah, and right. with a missile, ballistic missile, that could reach the United States of America. Yes. So. so what Bush said in 2002 may, may come to pass that it'll be catastrophic that the world didn't act, that the world remained indifferent. And we're seeing some of this uh, outplay right at the end of your story, Julie. Uh, Carmon said that uh, maybe what's going to happen after the Arab Spring, we see that it really hasn't led to peace like some people thought. And just a few days ago, perhaps uh, 24, 48 hours ago, Israel attacked a Syrian uh, chemical plant in Syria. Now, we, there's no confirmation that it was Israel, but we, we, if, if Israel did do that, it wouldn't be the first time. Right. What is the first time is that it was, it was not just a warehouse, it was a place where they actually developed weapons, and uh, not just chemicals, but other weapons, missiles, rockets, for 
use against Israel, probably, or, or their own people. So uh, probably Israel did do it, but we won't hear a confirmation on yeah, that. Yeah, so we really are on the verge of catastrophe, certainly with North Korea, John. Now maybe with Iran, its growing presence after, or as the Syrian civil war seems to be winding down, ISIS is being defeated or pushed back. Iran seems to be filling that vacuum with dire consequences for Israel. They are, and Iran's partner, Assad in Syria, has almost completely regained what he lost in fighting the Syrian rebels. And now we're talking about, on Israel's doorstep, an Iranian military base, uh, an agreement between the United States and Russia that says that a ceasefire in Syria could allow that to happen. And so you put all these things together, and red line after red line after red line is being crossed. And you wonder how long Israel can stand, uh, even if it has to stand on its own, how long they will tolerate uh, this kind of encroachment. And one other thing, John and Julia, that we're seeing at the Congress, uh, the Trump administration may be decertifying the Iranian nuclear agreement, sending it back to Congress. So we'll see exactly what happens there. That's going to be a big issue in the next few weeks or months. Well, Julie, John, great to be with you. Thanks for your expertise. And uh, John, uh, it's great to be have you here in person in Jerusalem, and we look forward to your next visit. Always great to be here. Coming up, an in-depth look at how Israel is known as the startup nation. Israel is known as the startup nation for the number of new and innovative companies begun in the Jewish state. And according to a new report, Tel Aviv is becoming the startup city as a research and development hub for such corporate giants as Visa, Amazon, and Barclays. One Israeli at the center of this economic boom is Jonathan Medved, the founder of Our Crowd. We talk with Medved at his Jerusalem headquarters. Jonathan, thanks for joining us on CBN News. Appreciate it. It's great to be here, yeah. Chris. For those that don't know, what is Our Crowd? So Our Crowd is the world's largest equity crowdfunding platform. What that means is that potential investors can now go to a website or a mobile app and actually discover and find investment opportunities in private companies. The average investor says, wait a minute, I want to get into one of these startups early. So at our crowd, we find these investment opportunities, mostly here in Israel, but increasingly around the world. And then we negotiate terms with the company. We join with other venture capital funds who are backing these startups. And then we invite the members of the crowd to join with the general partner of our crowd and to mm -hmm. fund these companies. So is this opening up uh, Israel to, uh, to a whole new? Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. right now, the majority of our funding is actually coming from Asia. Mm -hmm. And um, there are thousands upon thousands of investors who are hearing the story of what's going on here in Israel and say, I want in. I want to be involved in this incredible creation of wealth and, and, and also the creation of new technology. And to see not just that Israel's surviving, but Israel is thriving, that Israel is leading the world in so many technologies, whether it's agricultural technology or robotics or drones, this is, a, this is a, re a revelation. Everyone knows the story that the, the Red Sea split, um, but what they don't, many people realize is there was a gentleman named Nachshon ben Aminadav, who was of the tribe of Judah. He was the mm -hmm. Nasi of the tribe of Judah. And what we're taught is that Nachshon actually walked into the water before it split up to his neck. And it was only at that moment when he showed that commitment, that entrepreneurship, that leadership, mm. that God then completed the miracle and opened the sea. And today, Israel leads the world in this kind of action in terms of creating the new technologies that are great for the world. Do you see our crowd as sort of a catalyst for all these, this entrepreneurship and the... Uh... People say, you know, how do you like what you're doing? How do you keep you know, track of it all? And I, I respond that I've got the, the dream job, the best job in the world. What, what do I do for a living? I sit around and I listen to people tell me their dreams. Hmm. And then I have the ability to hopefully help them make it come true. I can't make it come true, but I can go then and raise money through the R-Crowd platform, mm -hmm. hand them a check, which in many cases is millions of dollars, so they can start to develop the product. So we celebrate that entrepreneurial mm -hmm. spirit of those Nachshon ben Aminadavs who walk into the water. And believe me, as someone who's built several companies in my career, and most recently our crowd, it is a little bit scary. 
Would you say this is perhaps a fulfillment of the promise too? We're talking about uh, in the book of Exodus, but in the book of Deuteronomy it says that uh, the Lord gives you the power to get wealth. Would you say that's perhaps a fulfillment Absolutely. as well? Absolutely. Look, we, in our tradition in, in Judaism, we have no celebration of poverty. Mm. Okay, um, poverty exists. You're, you're, you're taught to uh, mitigate it. You're supposed to give tzedakah, you know, to give charity. You're sure. obligated to tithe. But business people are partners with God. Business people are creating wealth. They're creating jobs. They're helping move technology forward. And we have to celebrate that part of business. Business needs to be compassionate, care. For example, our companies here, when they join our crowd, they join a, a, a venture philanthropy fund called Tumura, which means to give back. Mm. And we provide through our companies a stock option plan which gives back to the community. So when the company actually realizes its dreams and, and gets sold for God willing a billion dollars, there's money that rolls back into the community. When you speak to people, what's the main message you, you want to bring to them? Israel, first of all, loves and respects our Christian partners and our Christian brothers and the groups who are working so actively to support and to protect Israel. Your blessings and your prayers and your actions mean a lot to us. You know, you see groups of, 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 of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, dare say millions of Christians coming to the land to, to not just visit the holy places, but to experience the, the modern miracle of Jewish life reborn. The fact that Israel is out there leading the world in terms of innovation, that shouldn't surprise any Christian. It would be a surprise if it wasn't leading the world. This is the fulfillment of God's promise. And to sit together, whether it's through the vehicle of television or at other events, I find it invigorating and exciting and uh, uh, welcome you, know, you and your community to you know, work together and, and, and really uh, make the world a much better place. Appreciate it, Jonathan. Thank you for your time. Up next, a look into a medical breakthrough that could affect millions. An Israeli innovation in the medical field could revolutionize stem cell research. This innovation would increase stem cell production, and that could put patients around the world in touch with life-saving treatments. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has that story. Around the world, people are living longer. It is said that people that are born in the 21st century will have a median lifetime of more than 100 years. That brings new challenges to medicine. Dr. Shai Yarkoni of Select Biotechnology Limited says his company can help meet those challenges. So the 21st century medicine is called regenerative medicine. And the idea about regeneration is we move away from fixing with all the adverse effects that are there for the chemotherapy and the antibiotics and all of these issues to replacing them stem cells, the body's building blocks, can provide an answer because healing is their main purpose. That's the way we were created. We constantly heal ourselves through the stem cells. They sense death. They know how to get to the area where cells are dying. For them, that's a signal for activity because they go there, they find out what's missing, and they become that tissue. While the medical world sees the potential, an urgent need remains for enough stem cells to conduct mass research that will lead to new treatments. Yarconi says only Select can provide the enabling tool. We are the first one who took this biological approach and translated into a company with products and business. Thus far, technology has been incapable of isolating stem cells in a cost-efficient manner. The process begins in sterile labs like this with fresh or frozen stem cells. They're separated one by one, incubated, and run through a centrifuge, all to get one unit. We took this whole thing, this whole infrastructure, and condensed it into a simple product like this. Inside the bag, a mesh membrane mimics the healing process basically telling mature cells to die while moving to activate the multiplication of stem cells, 
that carry the healing properties. The physician or the technician takes the cells of the donor or the patient himself, put it in, leave it for two hours of incubation, and that's it. We show that we can work on bone marrow, on fat, on blood, even on cord blood, any adult tissue. According to Yarconi, products on the market now can take five to six weeks to grow in a lab and can have side effects. But he estimates Select's bags will cost less than 1% of what treatments cost today and be safer to use. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Kfar Saba, Israel. Coming up, Israeli families take a behind the scenes look at how the police protect both Jews and Arabs. Like children in many parts of the world, Israeli children are back at school. But before they return, the Israeli police held an exhibition showing how they protect the public. That's an example of what you can find on our social media channels. So please check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. That's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. And we'd like to give a shout out for those watching us on Sun Broadcasting in Arizona, one of the many networks carrying Jerusalem Dateline around the world. I'm Chris Mitchell. We look forward to seeing you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.